Today, I wanted to talk about self-sovereign identity. My, my name is Christopher Allen. I'm executive director of Blockchain Commons. I'm also co-chair of the Credentials Community Group. Uh, but most of you probably know me because of this. Uh, I wrote, uh, what, four years ago, The Ten Principles of Self-Sovereign Identity. And uh, it was very much intended to be viral. And I think it's been successful. But this is not going to be a talk about the basics of self-sovereign identity. I think uh, Drummond did a great job there. You should be familiar with the principles. There's a URL there. Uh, you should know what a DID is. You should, uh, we didn't talk much about it in the previous thing, but there's some details in the DID primer, and also the uh, uh, verifiable credential primer is another great reading source for this type of thing. And I do have a video that's kind of my equivalent of what uh, Drummond just did, a little, about a year out of date, but it's still a good video uh, at that URL. But what I wanted to do was talk about bleeding edges. Now, how many people know the English aphorism uh, bleeding edge? Uh, some of you may not, because it's, you know, uh, it's an English aphorism. Uh, it refers to two different things. Um, originally, it referred to things that were past the bleed line. So when you're printing something, you're going to chop the paper when you're all done. And there's some things that are going to be on the edge and might get cut off. And sometimes you actually deliberately want it to be on the edge, because that's really what makes a beautiful magazine or a beautiful book, is going right up to the edge. And then, of course, as books get bigger and things become more advanced, you know, the bleeding edges change. Um, but in more recent times, the aphorism has <coughs> referred to things like technology bleeding edges, which is where various kind of uh, 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 people out there are kind of aggressively pushing the envelope of technology and sometimes getting uh, uh, hurt by it um, because they've gone too far too fast. Uh, I know I've done this a number of uh, times on, in my career where you know, I really thought that we could do digital currency in, in 1992 and I got involved with DigiCash and came out here to Amsterdam the first time and you know, uh, you know, talked about all that type of stuff and it was clear that it was you know, 15 years premature. So um, you need to be careful about the edges. And I want to talk about some insights that I have of where the edges might be. I also might be wrong, okay? So there may be some wonderful opportunities here. But I want to talk about both these edges. Um, now, the edges are going to fall into two categories. The first category I'm going to talk about is uh, the ideology side, which is really what kind of brought people into originally uh, decentralized public key infrastructure and then self-sovereign identity. Uh, it has a lot to do with kind of the ideolo ideological principles uh, of it. Um, and then there's the bleeding edges about the architecture. Um, you'll see some coding. I use the philosopher on the left for those things that are sort of uh, ideology, and I have the, the uh, Parthenon as uh, my architecture ones. So the first one is uh, this distinction between less identity and trustless identity. So there are two uh, camps in, uh, well, there may be more, but at least two camps in the self-sovereign identity community, one of which I think is well represented in this room, which is the legally enabled self-sovereign identity, where you are trying to do something less in some <coughs> ways than the, old, the classic uh, um, identity in that you want to have minimum disclosure, you want to have uh, the individual have full control, you want to use cryptographic proofs, and you want the whole thing to have kind of the uh, legal enabling force of law. Um, but trustless identity is the other track. And I, trustless is not a word I'm actually a big fan of, but seems like everybody uses it, so I'm going to use it. But it's really kind of a trust minimized type thing. Like, how little can we treat? What, you know, trust, can we, what's the MVP of trust that is possible? Um, some of the key characteristics of uh, that uh, track of self-sovereign identity is anonymity, uh, some web of trust and reputation concepts, uh, censorship resistance is a very important part of that, and defense against, um, uh, well, human rights defenses against uh, big adversaries, nation states, mafias, uh, uh, multinational corporations. Is there a difference? Um, so uh, it was originally coined by Tim Buma. I want my identity to be digital, good, and better. But in the end, I want my entity to be less than the real me. Right? Uh, that's kind of one of the first principles of self-sovereign identity is your digital identity is not the whole you. You are not fully in a digital world, hopefully not in the next century. And uh, you want to be more than your digital identity. 
Um, but clearly, identity is for higher trust environments with real world identity verification, trust frameworks, privacy with accountability, and government acceptance. Um, trustless, on the other hand, so a lot of people uh, say that identity is local, it's insecure, it's very labor intensive. And then you know, the comment that uh, labor-based um, access will exclude large parts of the world, um, you know, a third of the world. Uh, 1.1 billion people have no legal identity at all, that digital or not, okay? Just any identity legal. Uh, and tens of millions of uh, uh, people are stateless. Like the, the places where they came from will not help or support any level of citizenship or identity for them. Um, so in the trustless identity track, we really want to, to, to balance this need for fairness and accountability, uh, which is part of the, uh, what happens in a legally enabled self-sovereign uh, architecture uh, to prevent uh, future uh, uh, violations of human rights. Uh, we also very much believe in that track uh, about the uh, right to be able to freely associate. And that's kind of an interesting problem uh, in our modern world. Um, and when these needs conflict, because they do conflict, we want to err to basically uh, the individual over large institutions or large groups. Because the, the real issue here is that as a percentage of who I am and how much effort I can expend and how much harm can come to me, um, I can accept not nearly as much harm as a nation state or uh, uh, you know, a multinational corporation. They can spend millions of dollars in fines and damages and recovery fees and, and uh, fix things. Uh, you know, I can't afford that. So that's why we need to protect the individual. So why do I care about it? Um, Yesterday, because I was in town, and I, it's something that was very important to me, I went to the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, which uh, uh, they had a very moving ceremony uh, at uh, um, the uh, Auschwitz Memorial in uh, East uh, Amsterdam. And uh, I didn't know it, but the prime minister showed up. Um, I didn't know who he was, because they were all speaking in this other language. You know, like, um, and. Uh, but it was very quickly kind of the crowd. You could kind of see they were all kind of very interested and excited about this. And I even saw a couple of tears. Um, it's because uh, the prime minister, um, uh, Mike Rutte, uh, apologized. He, and this is 75 years in coming. Netherlands has, the Netherlands government has never accepted some of the responsibility of what happened during World War II that led to the Holocaust. Um, when authority becomes a threat, our government agencies failed as guardians of law and security. Now that the last survivors are still among us, I apologize today on behalf of the government for government action then. And that was a very important phrase. I also translated this with Google um, Translate. So I may have gotten a word or two off, but I haven't found an official English language uh, version of this. Um, so what went wrong back in World War II? Well, you may not know this. I think most Dutch do, but if you're not from uh, uh, the Netherlands, you may not. Uh, Jews, as a percentage of population, uh, more died here than in Germany, uh, Germany Belgium, France, et cetera. Why was that so? Well, um, part of this is that the Germans took over um, the civil authority here. The, one of the first things they did was grab the archives. They immediately replaced uh, a lot of the different civil servants under their direct authority, management, et cetera, where as when like in France, uh, they used the local uh, civil administration uh, a lot more as managers and leaders of, uh, of that. Um, <laughs> This caused a lot of things. I think the, the Netherlands uh, general population was one of the, uh, made some of the largest protests against this uh, uh, violation of, uh, the, of uh, the Jews. Uh, lots of strikes, well, lots of different things, ultimately leading to an attack of the civil archives where they tried to burn down the whole building. Unfortunately, only 10% of the uh, uh, records were destroyed. 
um, these records were used because people were forging the identity um, uh, documents, which had a J on them, uh, which was probably, you know, I think I've heard, and I don't know this as a fact, that you know, during the Depression, the Netherlands was one of the best civil service um, uh, organizations in Europe for protecting people against the, a lot of the tragedies that happened uh, after World War II and, dur and then uh, during the Depression. They did a great job. Boom, Nazis come in, take their records. Um, now, it was pure coincidence. Oh, I, this was, I thought, cute. Uh, imp not cute, very interesting. So uh, resistance members forged identity cards at large scale, but they, could, but they could be detected because they could be compared against these civil records that were available. Um, there were some civil servants that were uh, actively uh, falsifying records in the civil registry so that they matched the identity records. Um, but it became a very potent weapon, and that's why more Jews died. Um, I like this quote from Thomas Rush. Uh, Where are the false identification cards and fake baptismal certificates in a world of immutable records? How can the honest to goodness hero fake an ID in a world where ID can't be faked? Uh, this is a living history. Um, it was pure coincidence. You know, I'm there. Afterward, a number of us went to the zoo uh, uh, museum, uh, zoo um, cafe, excuse me, and I had lunch with someone who was a, uh, uh, a child of two survivors of Auschwitz. Um, you know, I don't know what his age is, but I would say 70s. Um, he had also been very moved by the apology. He was the one who, who told me what really was going on there. Um, his mother had been rounded up in one of these uh, uh, razia things. So basically, when there was something went wrong, the Nazis would say, oh, go find these people on this list and go get them and take them away. Um, and those lists were constructed from those civil archives. Um, his father fled and was hidden by the resistance in uh, Utrecht. Um, but was ultimately betrayed, um, and probably because of uh, uh, the Stasi basically knew who everybody was and who their neighbors were and who their friends were and family members were, and were basically able to pursue them to find the people that had uh, fled Amsterdam. Um, uh, call this a for early form of social network analysis. So. It is this living history from survivors of World War II that is the reason why I think the Netherlands is a leader in things of such as the privacy support in GDPR. I think you have led Europe in a lot of the different discussions uh, that, that led to that becoming a standard. And, uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why you're reaching out to try to implement these self-sovereign uh, identity systems. But remembrance is still needed. It's 75 years now. You know, the children of them are in their 70s. <laughs> um, this passing of generations and also newer things like fake news are making this fade away. Um, there's still a need for trustless uh, solutions. Um, we need to be thinking about these in addition to the less identity solutions. Um, in Brazil, in Great Britain, in Poland, Turkey, United States, there are leaders that are using uh, discrimination and xenophobia to basically you know, rally their base. Uh, it becomes a normalization, which makes it easier to uh, uh, violate human rights, uh, academics, critics, journalists, Muslims, transgendered people, et cetera, are being actively attacked in some countries. Uh, there are new dangers. Um, the fact that my phone is collecting the fact that I'm in this room. Uh, if I was one of these populations and a citizen of one of these countries could make me in, uh, in trouble. I probably can't go to certain parts of China that other of you might be able to. Um, there are probably per certain parts of the world just because of my advocacy that I'm already personally at risk. So new dangers require new ways to protect human rights. But we need both. We need less identity and trustless identity. Um, the Netherlands is a high trust uh, society. In general, you trust the government. And in general, the government actually trusts the citizens. You can see this. It's a, it's a, it's a different kind of attitude than a lot of other countries and definitely different than the United States. And also, less identity is where the money is. Uh, Self-sovereign may have come from these trustless roots, 
Um, but almost every major advancement in the last two years has been funded around the legal, um, legally enabled self-sovereign identity. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is good. We want this. We want to fund these things. We want this to happen. We want to have legally enabled self-sovereign identity. But, you know, as we go to these standards efforts where uh, Drummond and I are going to spend three days in this in intense head bashing on things, there's a lot of people who want to say, no, you can't do these trustless things. You have to do it in the legally enabled way. Um, and uh, I want to resist that because I think this other part's important. Um, why is it loading? Okay. <coughs> there we go. So I would like to suggest that in, um, uh, in March 28th, that we have a four remembrance, okay? I would like to see um, uh, us actively have a moment of silence for Garrett Van De Ven, uh, who forged 30,000 uh, Jewish uh, civil records, uh, 80,000, excuse me. Uh, so he basically was an artist in sculpture and was had access to the civil records, and he forged 80,000 of them. Um, uh, William, and I can't pronounce the name, uh, Aaron Dias, and 11 others were found guilty of trying to bomb the archives. Uh, this is on the archives building. Uh, I walked by there yesterday, um, and we should be remembering them. Uh, and we should salute all the others who have died to protect uh, the defenseless in World War II, who have eased suffering in genocide's past, and also fought just discrimination, et cetera, in, uh, in totalitarianism. I also want this to be a for remembrance. It's a new word. It's not, an, uh, it's not a word in English. Uh, I, inv I invented it. But to for remember for those today that are at the front of this battle against uh, this type of... Uh, of uh, things. There are protesters in Hong Kong. There's the Xinjiang re-education camps or people trying to investi investigate and see, are these really concentration camps? Um, there's uh, uh, Gambia basically went on the defense uh, to take on uh, San Shu Ki to court here in The Hague uh, for the, the activities that are happening in Burma right now. So we have a third world country that is acting on behalf of people in general to try to prevent the uh, genocide of the Rohingya. Um, there are people in the United States that are trying to protect immigrant children, uh, also against Cambridge Analytica-like attacks against voting system and election systems, which there's a lot of elections coming up this year. Um, we need to remember forward for them, uh, and we need to celebrate all the people today and in the past that are uh, trying to address these types of problems. We need to salute those who are defending the powerless. So real important um, area in philosophy of, uh, and, and ideology of self-sovereign identity is acknowledge that this can happen. I'm not saying go to the trustless extreme. I'm not saying that in your trust frameworks you should support BTCR and the censorship and anonymous things that we do in our DID method. Uh, your trust framework can choose not to use those. But don't stop us from using those or other people who have different kind of frameworks from participating uh, in the, the fruits of your labor. Um, so there's this other tension, which is rights, not property. Um, I presume some of you are familiar with this, but this is a big difference between sort of the use, a lot of the US thoughts around uh, data, um, personal data and identity. Um, there are two different paradigms, and they have very s sneaky ways of trying to come back in. So in the United States, um, it tends to fall back to the paradigm of a uh, being a property right. Both identity, we say we own our identity, and we say that you know our identity is uh, you know valuable. So thus, you know it must you know have a dollar transactional amount with it. Um, whereas probably because of the experience from World War II, Europe has the more of the sense of identity and, and personal data being a uh, fundamental human right or something we really have to be careful about. Um, and not just freely allow people to transact. So um, 
uh, you know, identity as property rights. You can see it in statements like uh, the European Consumer Commissioner said, personal data is the new oil of the internet and the new currency of the digital world. And we have um, a musician going, we need to own our own data and be compensated for it. So we have this kind of ownership paradigm um, in uh, the state I live in, in California, in the uh, state of the state message by the governor, he said, hey, we did this rah-rah, we did this first in the nation digital privacy law. It's not as good as GDPR, but it's, it's the best in the US. Um, but California consumers should be able to share in the wealth that is created from their data. So I've asked my team to develop a proposal for a new data dividend for Californians because we recognize that your data has value and it belongs to you. Okay, that's this year, okay? Um, why not a uh, property right? Well, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but Elizabeth Reneris has some of the most impassioned and well-reasoned things in this area. Human rights, in stark contrast to property rights, are universal, indivisible, and inalienable. And she talks about how they, different, how they fit together, that a property law uh, paradigm of data ownership re loses sight of these. Um, so uh, Joe Andrew, a member of our community, uh, ownership is just one way to make rights enforceable, but unfortunately it commoditizes those assets and subjects them to the whims of the state and to those who control property. They can take it away at any point. If we care about the liberation of the digital self, we must resist turning identity into property despite its charm and convenience. So, we have been successful in the self-sovereign identity in the W3C and DIF and things of that nature to kind of convince the technologists to avoid the word own. So we increasingly have been turning to the term control. I'm sure you've been seeing this in some of these documents. <coughs> I'm not, we're not sure it's the best word, but it's better than own. Um, uh, but as we begin to interact with the regulatory and policy community, that ownership thing is coming back. Um, mostly in the United States, but it is happening in Europe, and I, I can't speak for New Zealand, but I suspect they're having similar problems. So be careful, this is a, this is a bleeding edge. Um, another bleeding edge, uh, well, good intentions, but bad results. So um, uh, ADHAR has so far saved the Indian government 12.4 billion, at I think a cost of a billion, so that's like a really good savings. Um, However, we have, I can give you a long laundry list of things like this. A lassie um, uh, can't get her grain allotment uh, because she can't walk and thus can't go to a place to authenticate her identity. Uh, there was another older woman who's, uh, as you get old, your fingerprints become less uh, uh, good and you can get cataracts in your eyes. So those forms of biometric authentication um, uh, stopped working. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, the, the civil servants had sort of this thing of, well, I can't do anything about it, bye, go home. You know, I can't help you. Um, uh, human dignity demands that people be treated uh, with respect no matter what the system is. That civil servant should have done something about it when it, when it didn't work and it was obvious that something was going wrong here. Because um, otherwise we just become data in a machine, entries in a ledger to be managed, problems to be solved, become digital serfs. We don't want that. Um, in general, I'll just say digital identity is a two-edged sword. It can do great, wonderful things, uh, but it can also be used in, in really awful ways. Um, we have to balance accountability, transparency, fairness, things that all of us have to do in a civil society with each other, which is why we have government and why we have these institutions. But we also have to protect the individual if the institution doesn't stand up to the, to the task. And when we, these conflict, we need to preserve the freedom and rights of the individual over the needs of the group. I believe in accountability for the power, powerful and privacy for everyone else. Um, this is beginning to go from philosophy. I'm going to talk about it from a philosophy point of view, and then we'll talk about it in more uh, architectural specifics. Private keys should have special protection. 
They're a proxy for a human secret. So basically, for a long time, we've relied on pins, these wonderful four-letter things that we can basically break in a fraction of a second with computers. Passwords, I think we're to the point now where any password less than 18 characters can be broken on Amazon with easily rentable stuff for about 25 to 50 bucks. So if you're protecting something that's worth more than about 50 bucks, um, you better have a password that's you know, up there in eight, like toward 18. Um, how many people have passwords that are 18 characters? Okay, so the only way you can do that, because you, you can't remember a bunch of these character, you know, of these passwords, is you gotta have a password manager. You have to have these things that augment our brains, because our brains don't remember this. Uh, pardon? Pa you know, passphrases and things of that nature. We're, we're using these tools to basically augment them, to uh, memorize these longer passwords, make them more random, et cetera. Um, when we get to cryptography, we're talking about really big passwords, okay? So the secret that's in a private key is on the order of magnitude where there's one for 70% of the atoms of the universe, okay? It's really hard to break a cryptographic key. But that also means they have to be kept secret, and legally they need to be a proxy that has all the rights for private thoughts inside your head, okay? Um, the other reason why is that we have no safe way of transferring digitally private keys. We keep on talking about, oh, we do we use SSL all the time, we do all these things, but that's because the private keys aren't shared, they're very carefully restricted, oftentimes they're in hardware where they can never be actually physically extracted from the hardware. We have no safe way to uh, transfer digital, uh, digital uh, private keys. In the case of self-sovereign identity, well, some of these keys are a little bit more visible, they're more uh, out there, they may be a part of an HD key phrase, they may not be locked into hardware, et cetera. Um, uh, we need to be careful about private keys. Once a private key is compromised, uh, their identity, their autonomy and authority can be compromised, evidence faked. Um, we can, once that happens, the fact that because we're in relationships with others, our spouses, our business partner, partners, other people can be uh, compromised because of our compromise. Um, so, I've been involved in Wyoming, uh, which is one of the more progressive states on cryptography, uh, for a new bill to protect private keys. Um, it prohibits the state from compelling a person to produce a private key. Um, they can still be compelled by courts to, to use the private key to you know, transfer in a divorce settlement the, the Bitcoin that the, the, uh, the spouse had to you know, be responsible to contracts and they have all the enforcement mechanisms that people currently have when they fail to do those types of stuff. But don't force them to produce a private key. And that is happening. There are courts that are basically going, give us the private keys. Um, you know, I, we need to add this to law. This is the current draft, which I was helped uh, write on uh, uh, legislation. I hope uh, uh, that it will pass in the next couple of months as uh, they meet. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, let me know. Um, now I'm moving toward the architecture out of the ideology side. So this leads to um, self-sovereign key management is really hard. Um, and a lot of the fundamental differences between the legacy identity technologies and the self-sovereign technologies is how they handle secret keys. So uh, in self-sovereign identity, I ideally the user has the keys, um, not the platform provider. They're not generated by Apple or Google. They're not generated by the US government. Uh, they're generated by you and they're under your control. This moves all the risks to the user. Um, and that's not practical. I mean, I've been studying uh, Bitcoin uses and how much losses on Bitcoin and people who are very sophisticated technolog technologists and should understand what's going on and the amount of failure is high. Uh, there are some solutions emerging, but there are architectural issues. One of the first is the area of master and child keys. There's a concept of a hierarchical key um, that's kind of emerged out of the Bitcoin learnings. Uh, which allows for a master key um, that can then be used to create child keys and those child keys can be used to create further child keys. You can keep, create millions, if not tens of millions of, of keys if you need to. And what, at the root of it, only 12 or 24 words needs to be stored. In my case, my master key is never on a computer. If it is on a computer, it's on a computer for a few seconds 
typically offline to create a new child key or to authorize something. It's not that hard to do, but it's not easy either. Um, there are very few self-sovereign identity platforms that are even really seriously thinking about the advantages of HD keys, and few use the child key features. Like you can ba basically create a child key. You know, I can have a child key on my phone. I can have a child key in the cloud. I can have all these different child keys that do different things for me. I have a, uh, an app on my iPhone uh, that basically it has a key on the iPhone. Uh, it has a key on a full node that it communicates to via Tor, so it's an anonymous connection. Nobody can know that I'm uh, connecting to my full node. Uh, it doesn't need a uh, resolver to talk to the blockchain. I have a $5 <coughs> AWS instance that has that. Now, AWS is not a secure place to store keys, but there's a key there because it's part of a multi-sig. It needs two other, well, it needs one of three keys in addition to its own for it to function. The third key is an offline cold key that's nowhere. I have this demo right now. It's doable. We ought to be doing more, like should we maybe it be a two of four? Should it be, there's some cool things you can do with a two of three and a four of nine that have good UI uh, uh, possibilities. Why aren't we talking about these types of things? A lot of master key practices that are out there. Um, in the Bitcoin community, most people still keep it on paper. Now, I live in California where we've had some major fires. Um, uh, obviously, Australia has experienced similar things. Uh, you know, if you're gonna put it on paper, at least put it on a waterproof paper. You can get it really cheap from Amazon. Um, but, uh, you know, I have seen uh, a steel safe evaporated because a, uh, steel melts at a, about 1,000 degrees. So um, what I recommend, which is in this free book called Smart Custody, is these titanium keys. They're relatively cheap, anywhere from the, the lower end or about 20 bucks for two, and at the higher end, it's about uh, 90 bucks for the really high end with the stamps and all that kind of stuff. This one was uh, a picture after being uh, uh, put to uh, 1980 centigrade, degree centigrade. They also put it in an acid bath. They also ran a press, uh, you know, a, a press on it, and it survived. Okay, you I could read all of that. Cold storage is, it's not on a computer, okay? But it can be very hot. Yeah, it can be very hot, right. <laughs> However, despite you know, you know, writing this book and writing all, a lot of the details of how this stuff works, et cetera, it still takes about two hours to do this. And I've had people with hundreds of thousand dollars of Bitcoin go, oh, I don't have time to do two hours to protect my millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. You should be doing it for me. I'm going, why? You haven't paid me anything. Um, so our identities, are they worth as much? I would say they're probably worth more. And so we need to be thinking about how do we do some of this stuff? What are some of the things, tricks we can do? I don't want everybody in the world to have to have do create one of these titanium keys and spend you know, two hours and a whole bunch of sort of some sophisticated knowledge to get it so that it's not on your computer anymore. Um, most people won't do that. Um, and you know, we need to come up with solutions. Uh, one area of solution that a number of organizations are using is uh, uh, thinking about social key recovery. So we've got all these wonderful friends, this trust network we have. Can't we use them to uh, split our keys? You know, there's something called Shamir secret sharing, which has some wonderful characteristics cryptographers look at it and they go, wow, because it's got all these wonderful security proofs or whatever. It's actually too secure. It's actually got some real problems because um, it's actually too good. So I can give you a share, and it's informationally, completely informationally opaque. Uh, you cannot know that anything using that information to know it came from me, or that, came, that anybody else who has a shard is that it's related to it. All of that is completely opaque. Um, and uh, you, you don't even know that it come, came from me. Uh, and then when later, when I've lost the keys, um, I've like lost, you know, everything's gone wrong, my disaster backup, my titanium key's gone, whatever, and I go to all my friends to recover the things. All it takes is one friend to give me a key back that is just a random number, and I won't know which friend did it. So one friend out of my wonderful key recovery thing can basically deny me uh, access to be able to recover my keys because they just basically substitute it. And I can't know which one of the blasted people did that to me. 
Um, so um, the Bitcoin ecosystem, which has been using Shamir off and on for um, you know, five, six years, is largely moving away from Shamir uh, to multisig. That's what I've been doing with that wallet that I can give you a demo later with. Um, another risk, though, with any form of uh, social key recovery is the cascade effect. I basically work really hard to break you, and you've got lots of friends who have lots of money. Um, now I've got some more shards because you are basically helping other people to, you know, to, uh, uh, recover their keys. And now I get Drummond's keys. Now between the two of them, I can basically get maybe 50 keys from people. So there's this cascade problem with social key recovery. We need to work on solutions for this. Um, most of those solutions are going to happen in the multi-sig space, uh, in particular something called threshold signatures. Uh, the, the two that I've been doing the most with right now are the two of three and a four of nine, because UX-wise, that allows me to do you know, three people, then four people, then five, six, seven, eight, nine. Users don't need to think about, what in heck is this two of three and four of nine shit? You know, I don't, I just do it for me. Um, instead, I can just say, who's your best friend? Who's your spouse? You know, a couple of other people, and I can add them incrementally. Um, Multi-sig design is not well integrated into current SSI architectures, um, and it's particularly useful in a number of scenarios with issuers, because now we can, do a, uh, we can solve certain types of problems with the issuer keys, because a lot of issuer keys are not technically self-sovereign. Um, they need to be controlled by the issuer in some fashion. But with multi-sig, we can actually make the sub-keys, uh, the multi-sigs, um, to, to have them be some form of self-sovereign uh, key. So um, one of the challenges to this is uh, we are largely using ECDSA in a lot of our uh, standards. Now, Sovereign does use 25519. I should probably add an add to uh, a thing to that. But uh, ECD, uh, ECDSA, which is what Ethereum uses, Bitcoin Core uses, et cetera, has some interesting privacy problems with um, ECDSA and multisig. Um, but they're also, in 25519, um, there are you know, challenges in multisig with them, even though they do snore. So we're just not really thinking about the multisig area. Um, uh, there's this new approach to things called smart signatures, um, and the, why they exist. How many people have used Ethereum-based uh, blockchain or uh, one of the smart contract uh, blockchains? Anybody? Okay, so a few people. Um, smart contract technologies have a large, complex attack surface. You know, the, the DAO attack, uh, what, $64 million at the time, uh, probably, a mil you know, it's about a billion dollars. Um, of Ethereum by today's value was uh, stolen because of an error in a smart contract. Um, a possible solution to this is something that's a much, much narrower and smaller, which is a smart signature. Uh, smart contracts do this complex thing that is called state change. Like, you know, you're going to have this big, big, big database. We want to represent the state change in the database. These smart signatures, the only thing they do is it's true or false. Is it yes or no? Um, so the simplest smart signature um, technologies can use a, a threshold multi-signature signature with some and and or statements and some tipple, simple time blocking. And I give an example of this. So it'd be a little script, and it'd be you know, like a computer language, but it's this signature is valid if five of seven of the board members say yes, and those board members are <coughs> accountable, so we know who the board members is, are that said yes or no, because we want our board members to be accountable. And 50 plus, or, 50 plus one of the stockholders said yes, but we can do that in an anonymous fashion so we know it's true, but we don't know who voted, so we can't coerce the people who didn't vote the way we wanted them to. And if the answer is no, if it, unless it's signed within 90 days and it's provable and it's some kind of timestamp um, that that is true. That's what a smart signature can do. Again, it's not something we're doing in, um, uh, in SSI. So. Um, these are my laundry lists, so I could, you know, I can go on for another couple of hours. I'm not going to. Uh, these are all on the left things that we're expecting to talk about at the next rebooting web of trust. Um, I'll be sharing this uh, whole presentation after, but these are all things that people have said. Uh, we want to use this rebooting web of trust process, this design workshop, this collaboration thing that has been so successful that helped make DIDs and make this whole thing work. Um, these are things we want to talk about. So there's encrypted data vaults. Uh, there's like four or five organizations that want to have your data in the cloud, but have it be encrypted in a self-sovereign way by you. 
verifiable content, there's some risk modeling, some wallet architectures, how do we do hardware with uh, self-sovereign identity, what is the minimum viable product for SSI uh, implementation. Uh, a lot of things you guys care a lot about, guardianship, uh, delegation, but some subtly different things like stewardship. Um, uh, and of course, reputation comes up every time, uh, and we make very slow progress on it, but, we've got a, but we're working on it. But these are not being discussed right now in the architecture side. Uh, revocation is scalable, has largely been ignored. Uh, I'm the co-author of SSLTLS. We still haven't figured out for that, what, 25-year-old technology at this point? Um, how do we recover uh, verifiable credentials? Uh, there's a bunch of correlation risks by behavior analysis or network stack, so we can do all this effort for these pairwise DIDs and these uh, selective disclosure crypto that because of our behavior or because of something in our network stack allows to be correlated anyhow. So we need to work on that. A um, lot of incentive design problem. We've got some interesting incentive design at various blockchains, but we need to have incentive design from top to bottom. Um, uh, we're, we've got a lot of wallets uh, you know, uh, emerging that do self-sovereign identity. Most of the self-sovereign identity wallets don't handle money very well. But Drummond, do you have any money in your wallet? Not yet. Not yet, okay. But uh, especially... Well, my, my physical wallet. Yeah. yeah. Mostly credit cards these days. Mostly credit cards. Some euros. Yep. Some euros. Um, so I know exactly, you know, your bank knows exactly what place you've been doing and the fact that you visited that particular Amsterdam uh, uh, coffee shop, quote, um, <laughs> and uh, all of that. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, so we need to work on architectures that support both of those um, in a uh, privacy preserving way. Uh, how do we pay for all these services that, um, that we're going to be needing? These encrypted data stores are going to be in the cloud. Uh, and then there's a lot of things around atomic transactions. A lot of the way trustless stuff works is it literally can't happen unless we both do it. If you do it, nothing will happen. If I do it, nothing will happen. But if both of us do it, it will immediately, atomically, at the exact same instant, happen for both of us. And there's some really safe things we can do there. We're not talking about that in the SSI community. Back to ide ideology. Um, at rebooting, um, one of the more interesting projects is what in hell is decentralization? Can anybody here define it? Uh, anybody want to have a boxing match in the next room? I can put two of you in there and you can fight it out. Um, platforms and multinationals as the new sovereigns. So you guys are legally enabled self-sovereign identity people largely in this room. Uh, which one of you is going to fight Facebook? Which one of you is going to fight Google? Okay, it's really hard to fight them. I mean, look what happened with the, what was the, the big fine for Facebook um, recently from the European Union? It was a really large amount of money. Nah, not for Facebook. Um, SSI for social networks. There are a lot of people who want to try to solve the fake news problem and other problems of social networks by moving to a decentralized social network. How do we do that? But also, how do we do it in a fashion that we actually don't make things work? I mean, I'm one of the people who basically said, oh, you know, you know these wonderful social networks and all these kind of stuff are going to make information more available. We're going to be able to be a lot smarter about stuff. I I'm, I'm certainly was uh, a bit uh, optimistic <laughs> um, and compared to what actually has been happening in this area. We could be repeating that error. Let's not repeat it. Um, uh, some of the trustless side of things requires something called an anonymous proof of unique personhood, because otherwise we can have um, uh, you know lots of one person try to attempt to be many people. Um, there are some interesting privacy-preserving methods of doing that. They're very early. We need to try some of those types of things out. Less identity probably doesn't need them very much, but it could be useful for them as well. Um, there is some, my favorite one right now is a proof that I'm not there. Okay, so, it, so basically we were in this uh, special ceremony uh, with people in other places around the world, and I can basically prove I'm not in Los Angeles right now. So that means I can be anywhere else in the world, but I'm not in Los Angeles. And if I do enough of these, I can basically prove to not perfect certainty, it's not finality, but I can prove to a high percentage, like 
that I am a unique person uh, and nobody else in the world uh, is, uh, you know, has something in that context of, of uh, personhood. Um, a lot of issues about global names. Uh, I've been putting tw everybody's Twitter names in the um, in some of the quotes. It's really clear, like when they got on Twitter from their Twitter names. So I'm Christopher A. because I was on there first. Um, you know, the Nick Zabo is Nick Zabo four because what a strange name, but he's the fourth one. Um, the, uh, the, the, this whole issue of global names, it, a lot of companies are making their money off of trying to basically be the new global name. They're trying to be the new DNS. Maybe it's decentralized or whatever, but I think we've got some challenges there. I'm sure the people in here who work with the passport office and, and things of that nature know the problem about unique names. And, and I know I have a friend here in, uh, in the Netherlands. He's, uh, his, he's a second generation um, um, uh, citizen, uh, but his family's from um, England, and his name is spelled D apostrophe R C A R C Y. But because of the way uh, the Netherlands handles things in the civil service, in the way other names are everything, every place he was having problems. He was constantly running things because everything would turn his name into being uh, R C, not Darcy, and his middle name would be D. Um, this was got to be such an annoyance that the easiest thing for him to do was go get a legal name change. So now he's Darcy, D-A-R-C-Y, okay? I'm sorry, that's not respectful or dignified, um, especially when we already know names aren't going to be unique, so why do we have to have some of these uh, problems? Um, and then there's the role of nonprofits in, and self-sovereign identity. We have all these different organizations that want to make money off of uh, of this. We also have organizations like Red Cross who basically have identified, we got a real problem here. We're working around the world and everybody wants us to give identity information to them. We can't do that and do our job. Um, so how do we get them involved in this? Um, a whole bunch of bleeding edges. We're not talking with Asia enough about their ideas around self-sovereign identity. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about co-option of these things. I think I could probably take the sovereign technology or the Veras One technology and whatever and turn it into an absolutely amazing Chinese uh, social credit network. Um, and uh, that would even give them more control over things than they have today. So how do we prevent these architectures, which are well intended and have these principles and all this type of stuff, how do we be sure that we can design them in ways that will make it harder for them to use these in that type of way? Um, how do we financially support things? Um, I'm going to be the bad guy here. Uh, you know, Hyperledger has got a bunch of uh, uh, new people working on a cooperative project to try to make better crypto for uh, the, all of this, the sovereign work. But unfortunately, there really isn't any financing for that. There's no money. Like they, they can't afford to pay me or any other professional cryptographers. They're pretty much relying on the generosity of the companies that are involved to each put in some, oh, I happen to have an extra PhD over here. Let's put him in here. Now, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But the point is, cryptographic software is really hard. It's not, you know, can't be done in an agile way. You can't, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, say, oh, we'll fix it later. So we need to find ways to fund uh, financial support and development and the security reviews for the software that we're depending on. This wonderful, you know, what's the green box at the bottom with the trust frame, with the, uh, the bottom layer trust? Uh, I can tell you as the co-author of SSL TLS and all the attacks over the years, we are nowhere near the level of uh, cryptographic review that we need to be. Um, how do we fund other infrastructure? I use Tor, so uh, Blockchain Commons recently stood up a Tor exit node, uh, which uh, helps support the overall uh, way the Tor uh, does. So we base, um, but there are you know hundreds of commercial companies around right now. Every Lightning network, a lot of other companies that are beginning to use Tor. Why aren't they supporting the infrastructure? How do we shame them, if we need to, into doing more than what is minimally necessary, which is nothing? Um, how do we do asylum? Uh, how do we deal with escape from, from uh, personal tyranny, you know, a, a bad husband or other different types of things? How do we do witness protection in a world of self-sovereign, legally enabled self-sovereign identity? Um, 
And then there's all the aspects of beyond the right to be forgotten. How do we have forgiveness? How do we have redemption? We can't do that with technology. You know, we're going to have to figure out how to do this as a cultural thing. Technology needs to, to allow it to happen. Um, but, you know, we need to find ways in our civil society to be able to have these because, um, uh, you know, the fact that something, somebody did something 20, 30 years ago wrong means that they lost their job or whatever. Um, the particular example I'm thinking of in the United States is uh, somebody ha being in blackface, uh, which is clearly a very discriminatory thing. It's not a very respectful thing. But 30 years ago, it wasn't in people's general consciousness. It is now. It's, do they have to be held to today's standard for something 30 years ago? Um, there's the other extreme of that. There are a lot of uh, people that went to jail because of minor pot violations and have you know, lost their uh, important part of their work life. Um, and now it's legal in a lot of states. What do you do? Uh, so these are all the ideology um, things. This is Rebooting Web of Trust. It's a collaborative event. I don't really like to call it a conference because we're not a sage on the stage. There's, you're not going to have someone like me standing in front of you for 40 minutes. Uh, you're going to go in there and we're going to find out, given the expertise in this room, we've got some really great experts in this room, to figure out what can we do in the remaining three days that will have the biggest impact in the world. But we have to finish it. We have to at least get to a first draft by the end of the, those three days. Um, we have policy experts. We have technologists. We have lawyers. We have, uh, we had an anim we have an animator who's do coming to uh, this next rebooting. And we had a comic book artist come to uh, the one in Barcelona. We need lots of skills because lots collaboration requires lots of skills. Communicating this stuff requires lots of skills. So the next one's in Buenos Aires. Um, we haven't announced where the one after that is. We wanted it to be in Asia. But it's getting a little more complicated to try to get people to commit to things in Asia right now because of the travel um, uh, issues there. Uh, but that's uh, rebooting Web of Trust. Um, if, maybe, yeah, um, the, uh, if the, um, I did this four years ago in the late spring. Um, and I really intended it to be a first draft. I'm a technologist. I actually, in some ways, would rather be coding on this phone than standing in, up here in front of you. I'm here because it's the only way I can get this shit done. Um, and uh, uh, I did not think that this would um, be the draft that people are using today. I really had hoped that we would have evolved it. And uh, I hope that if you're involved on the regulatory side or the lawyer side or the communication side and you have a passion for this, that within the next year we can have a revision of this. Like in particular, I've heard two different interpretations of principle one as I originally wrote it. And I don't agree with one of those interpretations, but I'm not the boss anymore. So we ought to fix that. And if it should be, you know, 1A and 1B, because they're both true, let's do it. But let's not have this be static. Uh, we can do better. Um, an ecosystem appeal. Uh, almost done. Uh, this is both the philosophy. Help me communicate these challenges. You know, I'm not a professional communicator. I don't spend, I'm not financed to come here to do these types of talks. I'm here because I'm trying to make a difference. Um, Help me communicate this more effectively. Where I stumbled or said something stupid, help me correct it. These slides are on the, um, the uh, Google Slides. You can comment on them. You can say, hey, here's a better uh, picture. Here's a better example. Here's some data you could use. You can also communicate with me on Twitter. A lot of this uh, is on Twitter. Um, I'm going to be in uh, the Netherlands for the next two weeks. So I'm going to be here, including a full day after um, Odyssey Connect and the hope to be able to connect with more of this community, because I think this is an important community. Um, I also want to say that both tracks of SSI are important. Uh, but because Less Identity has more financial support, you should be considering also helping support the other uh, uh, category of self-sovereign identity. So maybe put 10% of your funds in things that are really going to support the anonymous side, the trustless side, and things of that nature in self-sovereign identity, even though they're not going to immediately apply to the goals of your legally enabled self-sovereign so self identity, where you really don't want anonymous people. Um, but those things may be useful. So help us with that. And then on your side, demand interoperable standards, uh, specifications that are patent-free, royalty-free. These should be in your agreements. You should not put an RFP unless it says these are out there and free to implement.
okay? Um, avoid vendor lock-in. Yeah, I think there are some real risks where uh, com organizations are going, well, it's SSI is defined by X. And the whole reason why, um, you can blame me for, uh, well, you blamed me for uh, methods. Um, <laughs> you credited me. But I can be blamed for it also. Um, there are 40 of them. There shouldn't be 40 of them. And we're going to resolve that. But the bottom line is, it was more important to have that kind of flexibility because I do not know what is the best uh, uh, DID method. I don't think any of the current DID methods are going to be the one that you're going to largely use in five or 10 years. So uh, we need that flexibility. That's one of the things we, I learned from SSL and TLS was we had a lot of things that allowed the ecosystem to decide. Uh, the ecosystem didn't want perfect forward secrecy in uh, 1999 when we finished TLS 1.0. Um, we had the flexibility to add it. We knew about it. But the ecosystem said, nah, we don't need that. And then Snowden made all of his announcements. Oh my god, we've got to turn on this thing to get more privacy. Oh, it's already there. Cool, we'll turn it on. Um, that's the kind of things we need to be thinking about. What is, you know, let the decisions be decided not by the technologist alone. We need to have systems that allow for the marketplace and the needs of the world to, uh, to change it. Um, ask for multiple interoperable implementations. You know, uh, you know don't... Uh, just contract with, uh, I'm going to be blunt here, don't just contract with uh, Evernim to deliver a solution. Uh, find I another. <laughs> I'm not saying, go ahead and hire them. They're great work. Um, by the way, I have a small share, not because I bought Evernim, because you and I had an old company and Evernim acquired that company. So I have a little bit of, I have a little bit of bias in, uh, in, uh, in Sovereign. Um, uh, but say they have to either for help find somebody else to provide a, a, a different implementation, preferably as far away as possible, um, uh, or hire, have in your mandate when you're doing it to hire that, uh, a, a different stack, um, because we don't know what's going to happen in the next three or four years. Uh, a personal t uh, appeal, I'm not funded by, ver by uh, different... I have a namespace collision uh, by uh, uh, venture capitalists, um, nor am I involved with any ICOs. I've not participated in any ICOs. Uh, blockchain Commons was founded to be a for-benefit organization to support blockchain infrastructure and identity technologies, support better cryptography, et cetera. Um, and it is a not-for-profit. It's not a non-profit. It's a not-for-profit. Um, all of our stuff that we do is open source, uh, and we have a defensive patent strategy. Um, help me re continue to be a vendor neutral voice, to continue to be able to bring these types of larger picture things to you. Um, support uh, open source software, um, as I've been doing, all of our stuff is available on GitHub. Help me re represent the voice of the smaller developers, the emerging opportunities, uh, and continue to be involved with standard bodies and technology events. So, uh, uh, you know, this uh, two week trip to uh, um, Amsterdam is not supported by, um, uh, you know, a venture capitalist or my company on rev future revenues that someday somebody's going to pay them. Uh, no, I have to pay for it now. So I want to continue to be able to do that. So uh, I can be an advisor. Uh, oops, I can be an advisor. I can help you with your uh, security reviews, other different types of things. That's my contact information, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, pretty much everything you need. That's it.